guys, welcome back to Too Cool for Middle School. Today I get to talk about books and I'm so excited. I love giving history book recommendations. I'm just like not always sure that that's what people want to hear. But I was on Teachers Connect the other day and if someone gives me even like the slightest bit of encouragement to talk about history books, I'm in. And someone did, so I'm running with this. This is the perfect time of year, you know, right at the beginning of the summer to ask for advice from other teachers, especially about books or like, you know, things that you could just research over the summer while you've got a little bit more free time and just kind of brush up on things before the school year gets started. I know it's really hard to read a lot of books or like immerse yourself in a lot of research when you're just working on trying to teach and create lessons. So now is the time. So um, someone said, hi everyone, what are some good books to brush up on content? I will be student teaching in an eighth grade American history class and I'm nervous about my content knowledge. Any recommendations are appreciated. So you know I was all over this question. I was like, ooh, let me look at my bookshelf here. Definitely got some recommendations. I do what I can to not have our little apartment be overrun with books, so I do get rid of books pretty often. And I didn't keep all of them from like college and my master's courses and stuff, but if they were especially good and I thought that they were ones that I could refer back to while I was teaching, then I did keep those. So it was pretty easy for me to look at my bookshelf and think like, okay, these would be good resources for someone just starting to teach American history. This is going to be a completely incomplete list. Just by the nature of it being a list <laughs> that I'm trying to like narrow down here, it's gonna be incomplete, but what I was thinking is, okay, if you're teaching US history according to the textbook and the pacing guide and everything, you're gonna start with like the American colonies and go into the revolution and the constitution and slavery and interactions with Native American tribes. And for the eighth grade curriculum, at least in California, it only goes up until like reconstruction. So on this list, I don't have any books about like recent American history. This is all pretty far back. Okay, so what you have to keep in mind when you're teaching early American history is that you're teaching about this clash and conflict of three different continents. Okay, so the way that we were taught about kind of like the inevitability of Europeans taking over the Americas is something that you kind of have to combat if you were educated in the United States because the way that your brain processes information about interactions between Europeans and American Indians and black slaves is probably, um, it, it has some myth to it and, and not as much reality. So one thing that I would suggest is um, picking up this book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, The Fates of Human Societies by Jared Diamond. This is one that I had to read fairly often in like my master's classes, but usually it would just be like a chapter or two here and there. So he wrote this really, really long book about collisions and cultures and the way that humans from different ways of life interact. He writes really well, like I just opened to a chapter called Zebras, Unhappy Marriages, and the Anna Karenina Principle. I think that this is a really important one just for like your base knowledge about the interactions between different groups of people. If you don't want to read the whole thing, I've heard that there's um, like a documentary based on this that you can find on YouTube. I think it's in a couple different pieces. I kind of want to watch that as well, but think that's an important place to start. Along those same lines is this book called 1491 by Charles C. Mann. And this is another like exploration of just different groups of people interacting and, and what the Americas were like before Columbus invaded, landed, discovered, whatever you want to call it. So these two are pretty good for just getting like your base knowledge there. I have another little duo for you because US history begins with British people coming to this land that is filled with people already. It is not this just open, empty, virgin land. There are civilizations and nations and tribes 
already here. So one really interesting book about this time period and what it was like for the people who were already here is called Facing East from Indian Country by Daniel K. Richter. So already this kind of puts you in the right mindset, right? Like we always think just kind of automatically of US history as like, okay, you've got Europeans and they're coming west and as the US progresses, it moves west. So this really switches the perspective and instead you are facing east from Indian country. And this book is so interesting. I'm just looking back at like the things that I underlined. There's a whole section in here about beavers and like beaver pelts and how the French wanted um, like these, these beaver pelts and literally like there would be Indian tribes that just had like storage units full of like these, they just saw them as kind of like worthless blankets. And French people came in and they're like willing to give them guns and ammunition and all of these really valuable things for these like old rags that they had lying around and the Indians were like, sure, we'll take that for, here, go ahead. So interesting, it talks about like the different food sources and then it definitely gets into the issue of disease. One thing to, to just note is that for most tribes, they didn't domesticate animals. So, you know, they would, they would go out and hunt. And any diseases that the animals had weren't brought into the community of humans. But Europeans domesticated animals and brought all of these pigs and cows and things right up next to their homes and sometimes into their homes and these diseases would pass between animals and humans and it was really unsanitary and some of those types of like cultural practices had huge implications when two different cultures collided because disease is invisible and powerful Ugh and killed lots and lots of people. So this one is amazing. The other one that I would say to maybe read along with it or just read one of these two is called The Indian's New World, Catabas and Their Neighbors from European Contact Through the Era of Removal. This one is by James H. Merrill. He is a very respected historian. And so the Catawba tribe or the Catawba nation was in like the New England area of today. And so um, when you're studying like the colonial era or American Revolution, um, this is set during that time. So this is a really important perspective to include while you're studying that unit. Okay, so we've got those four books. Now let's talk about like the, the development of the Constitution and of this American democracy. Um, one that I'm going to suggest that is great, and I got to see him speak in person one time, it's really cool. Uh, this is called Unruly Americans, The Origins of the Constitution, and this is by Woody Holton. This is just so good. Man, this makes me like want to go back and do my master's again, except for not really. I underlined so much. So this book is about the people who didn't frame the Constitution, but who had an impact on the framers of the Constitution. So a couple of things that I see underlined is, it is an unsettling and inescapable fact that several of the principal authors of the US Constitution, which has served as a model for representative governments all over the world, would have never made it to Philadelphia if their constituents had known their real intentions. These were the elites who, you know, arguably still run our country today. So another thing that I underlined says, since nine in 10 free Americans were farmers, the framers were, demographically speaking, unrepresentative in the extreme. So this book is a really interesting look at how more normal Americans, the people who were actually going to be affected by these laws and these rights that they codified in the Constitution, really felt about these things and framed what we follow today. Another book that I have around here somewhere and I can't find it, it's kind of a skinny book so I keep losing it, but it's called The Second Amendment, A Biography, and it's by Michael Waldman, and I'm about halfway through it. I need to figure out where it is and finish it, but it's another really interesting look at um, what people were actually talking about, like in the newspapers, in these meetings where all of the delegates were writing and discussing and arguing, like what were people actually saying? So it's full of quotes and letters and it really gives you a sense of what was happening in the colonies or in 
the almost United States while people were writing the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. So that one's nice and short and I think that even though it really only covers the Second Amendment, it just gives you a nice base for understanding the process by which the Constitution was written. Another one that I think would be good for this, and it's on my shelf and I haven't finished it yet, is the Ron Cher Now Alexander Hamilton book, which the Broadway musical is based off of. That one's pretty long, but it's good. These ones right here are books that I still need to read. I've got a couple over there that I'm really looking forward to reading and I will review them for you when I'm done. Another one that I would suggest is called American Slavery, American Freedom by Edmund Morgan. Why did I feel like this was written by a female? I'm not sure, okay, but I'm pretty sure this is the book that I'm thinking of. This one's in my classroom, so I can't uh, show it to you, but I remember this book really having an impact on me and the way that I teach because it talks about, again, like the creation of tax laws and, you know, compromises about slavery and laws about slavery, and it had so much to do with taxation. And so when I taught eighth grade U.S. history, we would, we would always talk about how there would be this constant argument and kind of tug of war going on because slave owners always had to like redefine what slaves were. So they would say, well, they're property. Okay, so if they're property, then legislators would say, all right, then we need to tax you on them because we tax you on your property. And then they would say, oh, no, 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 they're, they're humans. They're not property. This is part of our population. So count them towards our population and don't tax us on them. But then people would say, oh, they're humans. Oh, they're part of your population. Okay, then you can't enslave them. And they would say, oh, no, no, no. I mean, I mean, they're our property. So that's why we can enslave them. Oh, they're property. Okay, we can tax them. No, don't tax them. They're people. Oh, then free them. No, 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 wait, they're property. Oh, don't tax them. So there was always this, um, you know, illogical, circular argument going on because slavery is illogical at its root. But I remember that one being really good and really um, helping me bring to life like some of those compromises and those laws and legislative issues that you have to teach to your class somehow and not make it super dry and boring. But when you can bring it to life that way, it really helps. One last book that I just started, so I can't say too much about it. This is an older book. I think it was published in 1963, but this is by Lerone or Leron Bennett Jr. Uh, Before the Mayflower, A History of the Negro in America. And I've read a little bit of this one, and I think that the way that he has the chapters organized would make this um, very useful for a teacher because he has chapters called, for example, Negroes in the American Revolution, Behind the Cotton Curtain, Slave Revolts and Insurrections. So you might not need to read the whole thing at once. You could read like different chapters um, depending on what you are teaching. It also has a lot of pictures got some pictures like this and I always appreciate when books show images just so that I can look up those images and use them with my class here are a couple of other ones so I imagine that this one would be really useful for teachers here's some more and I can give you um, a better review of it after I've read more of it. Okay, I will link all of those books below if you're interested in picking any of them up. Most of them are pretty common, so they might be available at like your local library or a college library if you still have access to that. But that's the thing about being a historian or a history teacher is that you will be reading for the rest of your life. If you're gonna be a good history teacher, you need to be very, very well read. There is constantly new research coming out, new books coming out, and that's really exciting to me, but it can be difficult to stay up on all of it. So this is a little curated list of some of the books that I think are really good and will really help you in particular if you're a teacher. Use the details that you learn in there, underline, highlight, pull out things that you can use with your class. These are the things that make history come to life and make history fun. So thank you so much for watching and thank you for that question. You can go to teachersconnect.com. I'll leave a link down below. And if you have some really good books that you would like to recommend and you've got some that you think are even better for history teachers, you can leave those in a comment on that thread and then this teacher will have a nice list of books to choose from. Thanks again for watching guys. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.